You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. Your host, Ken Lane. been doing this for a lot of decades now, just sharing what's going on in the landscapes of the high country of Arizona. This would, this would be a, a, applicable to New Mexico, Southern Colorado, all this. Once you get above the desert, come up that hill from I-17, it's all of us. I'd say from Kingman to Payson to the White Mountains to Flagstaff and all the way down to really uh, Black Canyon City, Cordes Junction, all of the Sedona, Verde Valley, Cottonwood. This is advice for us. And there's not many of us here, so very few people take interest in us, locals, hit this, this level. Most of the garden information you get, they're going to be produced for L.A. What, you got 24 million people down there? It dwarfs every, every other uh, uh, metro center, uh, Chicago, all the way over to Boston, down to D.C. Uh, that's, that's where a lot of people, most of the country lives and gardens. So they're producing content for there because it gets eyeballs and they can make more money. So that's kind of how it works. So it's hard to get books and, and YouTubes and videos and, and radio programs for the mountains of Arizona. But hey, that's why you tuned in here this week. Now, I'm, I'm seeing that it looks like the monsoon pattern was in Texas two weeks ago. Then we had that hurricane little pattern. A little bit of rain hit us. That's good. It's been a week now or a little more. And now you're seeing that monsoon pattern has swung. It's now going up and down to the middle of New Mexico, I say Santa Fe in that area, it'll quickly, I, I predict by next week, it'll be over at the Arizona-New Mexico border. That area, you'll just see this, this Mexican water, this, this, this uh, uh, rain and this, just south of us in Mexico, it's floating there. It's just heavily drenching things down. It's, it's humid. And then as we heat up, it draws that moisture up to us. You can watch this, this stream of water kind of swing over and it just, you can see the monsoons arrive like a month ahead of time. So I predict we're probably two to three weeks out before we actually see the monsoons, but we're close. It always hits in July. You just never to quite know when often suddenly over the 4th of July weekend, my hope not because Lisa and I will be up on uh, Lake Powell enjoying the, uh, the uh, entertainment and, and God's environment and that whole lake, which is, magical. Uh, I'd rather do it without rain because rain up there is terrifying. When it lightnings and that lightning bounces off the, the canyon walls and flashes off the lake, it's terrifying. Much less the waterfalls that flow over the edge that can actually be dangerous, drown your boat and and kill you with rocks falling on, on you kind of stuff. So keep it dry. I'll just enjoy the, the weather up there. And then we'll move on right after we leave. Then start raining. <laughs> Can, can you do that? Lord, can you do that? Yes, he can, but he's not listening to me. <laughs> Wait, to take advantage, though, of the monsoon rains, here's the secret. It's all about timing. There's going to be another planting season. It's going to be the summer planting season. You're going to see your landscape just flourish, just go crazy as soon as that first bit of rain hits. That mon that afternoon humidity, is the, is the, it seems like the secret. If you mix a little bit of rain in the afternoon per week, every once in a while, but with that humidity, it's shaded. The humidity goes up and the plants respond. You put any amount of moisture into the soil, it, it's, it's a game changer. If you know that's how the regular summer monsoon pattern is, you take advantage of it and you fertilize right at the front edge of that, land, of that uh, planting season and your plants will flourish. Whole new bloom cycle. All new evergreens coming out, all new, a whole, the leaves that look so beat up and torn and, and just like they've been beat up and torn, they'll flush brand new leaves and they'll look like brand new plants. The secret is plant, I would say fertilize. Now there's two things that I would say would benefit your landscapes within the next couple of weeks. First and most important, the things that are stressed out, that if, if you look at your plant and go, obviously, it's look at that. The leaves are smaller than normal. Less, it's still thin and wispy. Or I just helped a customer, his uh, aspens, sycamores, they haven't died. 
the limbs are still nimble. They're still flexible, but they haven't leafed either. Those are crazy stressed out. Pour the water on them before the monsoon gets here and then put around that drip system humic, H-U-M-I-C. It's put out by Natural Guard. It's kind of a really specialized plant. You're not going to find it at a box store or some. It's, you, you got to go to a garden center to find this, a nursery. And then they got to know what they're doing. But humic is humic acid. Uh, if you take a compost pile and just, you just boil it down, you compost it right to its last element, what you get is humic acid. If you spread that underneath, it's like a granular mocha. It looks, actually, it looks like dried coffee. If you're doing, uh, 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 freeze-dried coffee. It looks like that. You spread it around, water it in, it goes into the root zone, and it does not feed your plant. It feeds the soil underneath your plant. So all the worms start becoming more active, aerating the soil. Uh, the, the beneficial uh, fungi and mycorrhizals, they start waking up, and they start tickling the feet underneath. In the soil level, they tickle the the roots of those plants, so they want to root out deeper and stronger and longer and bigger and thicker, and they just root more. If you get more roots underneath those those stressed out plants, especially or any new planting that you just put it in this spring, that's just a young infantile. You need more roots on that plant, and it takes a couple seasons. It would greatly benefit by having natural guard humic sprinkled around there and then watered in. I think a bag goes. It's very inexpensive. Uh, it's like 20 bucks a bag. I don't know exactly. It's like 20 bucks for, and it goes 2,000 square feet. But for stressed plants, or you've got a native that's being attacked by bark beetle, or you can see that flathead borer have gotten in underneath the bark or, or scale or onto your pinion pines, they would greatly benefit by using humic. And, and now's the time. Do that on and water it in in a couple of weeks, the first part of July. I would actually use a real plant food, actual plant food. And please, folks, the, the, we're going to get some, some gully washing kind of rains. That's the way the monsoons work in the mountains of Arizona. Now, some of you are skeptical going, oh, no, it's, we haven't seen rain in forever. I'm telling you, a wet pattern's coming. We don't know how much wet. And when it comes, it comes at us so fast and so furious that most of it runs down the creek and so we really want to be careful what we're fertilizing with. We do not want to use synthetic fertilizers or petroleum-based chemical fertilizers. This is your Scott's Turf Builders, your miracle Grows, your the, the name brands that are using. I mean, you stick your hand in that bag, and it feels like your hand is starting to burn. If you get it on the leaves or you spill it on your flowers or, or the lawn, it will burn a hole in that, in that lawn. We don't really want to use that for the, the start of the monsoons because it releases so fast when it gets wet. It just releases all the nitrogen very fast. And quite honestly, most of it goes downhill, goes down the, the dry wash, goes down with these gully washers, and the plants never get to use it. You just wasted most of your money and your neighbors get to use it because they're, they're, they're trees of benefit or more than likely, you just polluted all of our drinking water as it races down to the wherever the water table is. So we really want to use organic or natural products. And that's why I made, I mean, I used to be the largest fertilome dealer in the state of Arizona. I, they wouldn't go to natural. They just said, chemicals are our thing. I'm going, well, not in my book. So I made my own fertilizer that's natural. So it's cottonseed meal and bird guano and iron and sulfur and all this magic good stuff. And that breaks down very slowly over a very long period of time. So if you get one rain event, it doesn't all dissolve and become active right now and possibly burn. Or it's safer for your pets. It's safer for birds because it breaks down slowly over, over like a three-month period. It's called Waters All-Purpose Plant Food. It's a 744 mix. Uh, I guess, you know what? We should also cover what is that number? So what are those numbers? And I don't know if I have enough in this segment to go over that. But 744, just to set the stage, nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. And some of you engineer kind of folks are, well, the bigger the number is, the better it is, the more value, the better. No, it's not about the number size. It's about how long does it release over, so, so the plant can take up as much of that number as it can. That's where the natural 
fertilizers are more effective because it breaks down source so the plant takes in all of that seven instead of a portion of that 202020. We'll be back. We got a lot in store this this program. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our little Janie Gara. Little Janie is a charmer with flowers that float above this 15-inch plant. The fluorescent pink flowers will wow the hummingbirds with Janie's charm as well. Hummingbirds throughout the neighborhood will visit your plants. They're just so popular and only $14. She thrives in hot, dry gardens and only found at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love their native plants to be beautiful and hassle-free, they love to shop. Hi, Elisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Royal Burgundy Barberry. We finally perfected Barberry with Burgundy Velvet Foliage that holds its color through summer, changing to red in fall. Celebrate summer heat and hardy as can be, and Havelina are no problem. This knee-high shrub grows with little to no care. A big, bold plant is just $36 and only found at Waters Garden Center. 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love Royal Barberries, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She brings each week your garden questions. Just what is what are other people seeing out in the uh, the highlands or the central valley or just northern arizona not not the desert stuff although they might have seen it too they're just so much earlier than us it's it's hot down there <laughs> it's hot here it's hot up here <laughs> 90 degrees is really hot for mountain folks 90 degrees for phoenix is like uh cool be, cool it's like, um, like term, i better get a parka coats on. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny we we both dated uh, through college basically you're my college sweetheart yeah. or was i your college sweetheart uh, maybe what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, ASU, okay, go, mm-hmm. go Sun Devils. Actually, our family's from all three schools, but uh, you'd see all the Midwest Chicago folks. It would be like 60 degrees out. We'd be literally in parkas. I mean, we're from the high country, so we were from Prescott, grew up here, but uh, they'd be out there sunbathing, white as could be sunbathing <laughs> out underneath the orange blossoms and we'd be going they're crazy mm-hmm. it's all a matter of perspective on what it cold is. is isn't it that is true but hot is just hot i can take it i like it up to about 105 and then it's just yeah. like your head's in an oven all the time see i get over 80 and I yep. get cranky <laughs> between between 78 and, and 81 <laughs> is my per, is my perfect spot <laughs> that is true <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's why God made sweat plants. Sweat glands. <laughs> he just sweated out. Detox. Yeah, but guys can do that. What, women, what? women start sweating, and they just—it's not pretty. I thought it was glistening. <laughs> no, to, I sweat. We we digress <laughs> terribly. We should get into some garden questions. What what do we got? Well, speaking of heat and stress, uh, Tom is in Prescott. He says all the native oaks in my neighborhood are looking. Horrible, brown and dried. Are they going to come back and be okay, or are they goners? Well, okay, that's partly drought, but that's they're all dropping now. And that's when they that's when they do it. They drop in the spring, or is this summer now? I forget. It's right there. It's, we hit uh, so it's summer. So it's uh, this is when they drop. So as that new leaf bud pushes out, it forces or sheds the old leaf off. And so it's just now starting to wake up. That's why they're typically more firewise than some of the other, let's say, manzanitas or some of the junipers. It's because they shed their leaves. As long as you clean that up, that's also <laughs> called fuel. If you clean that up, uh, the new leaves are less prone to, to fire because it's tender. So they're more supple. Mm-hmm. They've got more moisture. Oak is a very hard wood. So it burns very smolders, not flames up. So it's, mm-hmm. that's, that's one of the reasons why, because it does it. Now, it's actually not evergreen. It's yes. just deciduous in the spring <laughs> instead of in the fall. I don't know. So pin oaks are more traditional. They mm-hmm. grew up in Groom Creek in those areas, the right. hilltops. 
But the emery oaks, they, they went deciduous maybe a month ago. And then the scrub oaks right now are starting to defoliate. There's kind of a sequence mm-hmm. to them. Normal. So we, just, we just need to be patient and yeah. they'll leaf back out. Yeah, I would say fertilize them. Mm-hmm. And they'll be the most luscious blue green color you've ever seen. Just now, would you water them at all, or just you think they're fine? So I would. I would water the emery oaks, the great big tree, the trunky ones, mm-hmm. the, the tree forms. Scrub oaks. That's basically a weed. <laughs> it comes up everywhere. Don't need to do anything. His question is, which ones do I need to kill yeah. to thin things out so I can see my landscape? Mm-hmm. And they've got a root that goes down to China. It's huge, chunky, knobby. And so they're hard to get out of the ground. So I, I would say you don't really need to water mm-hmm. unless you really, if they're a front and center piece or in that island where your driveway is, you really want them to look like rock stars, yes, water them because they will get stressed. Uh, I would say uh, manzanita. Mm-hmm. There's some there really taking a beating yeah. this year. Uh, whole sections are dying out because the, of the drought there. Mm-hmm. If they're important, I would water them. If they're not important, I would cut them down and get them out of there because they are a fire hazard. Mm-hmm. They will go up. If you look at them with laser beam eyes, <laughs> they will go up in flames. They're like a tinderbox. And right. if they start dying out the middle, they're, they're even worse. Mm-hmm. So important to keep them hydrated if they're important, uh, if they're valuable to you. I would say also pinion pines, ponderosas, uh, the things that are really, uh, some folks bought their house because of that 300-year-old pinion pine or the grove of ponderosas. I would water those, and I would water them once a month. Don't overdo it, and I wouldn't put them on a drip system, but I'd take a 50-foot soaker hose and just kind of snake it around and run it for half a day. Just let it seep out of that soaker hose, and that'll keep them. And I do that in the month of April, May, and June. By July, it's starting to get moist. The humidity's up. The humidity level goes up. There's afternoon showers once or twice a week. Uh, kind of the pressure's off at that mm-hmm. point. But keep them healthy, and they won't get bark beetles and right. scale and some of these flathead borers. All these they're starting to be they're starting to attack the trees. And so, because of the stress, if yours aren't stressed, a bug would rather not attack your plant because it's healthy and strong. They'd rather attack the weak, mm-hmm. and they know there's a a turpentine smell that pine trees and, right. and things throw off that the bugs hone into. It's like a radar going parties over at this, at this house. So we're going to eat that tree until it's completely dead. Then move to the next one. That's mm-hmm. how they kind of work in the forest. Mm-hmm. Good question. Yeah. Okay. Next question is from Nadine. She said, my roses bloomed beautifully this spring. Now they're not really budding. What can I do to help them along? Food, 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 food. Fertilize. Um, and that's, that's where that uh, fertilize we put together, the 744 all-purpose. That stuff, the main ingredient in that is cottonseed meal. And roses think they've just, they're like at a smorgasbord. They just, the buffet time galore. Sprinkle some of that in, water it in. They will take it up and you will be budding. They'll be in bloom within 45 days if you do that. Can we, can we hold you to that? You know, if you deadhead, okay, <laughs> if you deadheaded, if you did these three things, deadhead all the spin flowers, mm-hmm. you gave it all purpose plant food, and then you put that humic, humic uh, uh, acid on, acid on mm-hmm. oh, guaranteed 45 days, you can count on it. If you're just going ha- casually about it, maybe it, maybe it take 50 or 40, I don't know. <laughs> but the way we do it, like we, oh, we yeah. take all of our roses, we have them bloom Mother's Day weekend, we want them all in bloom right then, and we'll sell hundreds of roses in just a couple weeks. We do it by... 40, what do, when do we want them? Cut them back 45 days ahead of time, fertilize them, and they will be fully budded. You can count on it. It's almost like clockwork with right. roses. And they should. I mean, roses will continue to bloom yeah. up until a hard frost. Well, it so. depends. Some of the old-fashioned roses, if they've been in a long time, if their mm-hmm. grandparents planted them, maybe not. Mm-hmm. There used to be single bloomers. Or if they're a, really? a, a, a not, there's a, uh, what's the one, the tombstone oh, Lady rose. Banks. Lady Banks. Lady Banks rose only blooms once in the mm-hmm. spring. It's the right. thornless one. Cecil Bruner is that way too, isn't it? Oh, it it has a couple flashes for the year that kind of smatters. just mm-hmm. depends. So it's considered an ever bloomer. But you really, for your yard, you want an ever blooming variety of, of rose. Otherwise, why plant a rose? You want it to bloom, mm-hmm. bloom all the time. Well, yeah, that's true, Ken. <laughs> well, here's another blooming <laughs> question. So Pam wants to know, do daylilies bloom all summer? Or do they only bloom for a certain period of time? Well, it depends on which. It's just like roses. It just depends. 
Generally speaking, if you're a collector of uh, daylilies, you've got early, mid, and late bloomers. And you'll plant a smattering or several varieties. And so there's always a different color coming on. There aren't very many daylilies that are ever blooming. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some. That's what Stella Dior is so famous right. for. That's why it's the number one seller because mm -hmm. it is an ever bloomer. It's a very long bloom cycle. We're trying to introduce more varieties of the Stella Dior or Dior series because mm -hmm. they bloom longer. So there's ever blooming varieties. Uh, and then there's seasonal. They just bloom for maybe six, no more than eight weeks. And they're kind of done. There's a summer window, late, late spring, early summers when they're, they really show their mm -hmm. stuff. So, so that's one. they're going to be better in perennial beds. It, it would be. Oh yeah. Rather than Definitely. just like a single in a pot. Right. Yeah. De well, they're, they're pretty without the, the, the flowers too. If you think like a gardener, it's like a big grass, like yeah. a big fleshy, soft. I mean, you just want to rub up against it. It's a very pretty plant. Mm -hmm. The flower is almost just a bonus. And then it's so drought hardy. It, you can guarantee it'll come back next year. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So it's a great, strong, uh, perennial for the mountains of Arizona at all elevations. So good questions this week, folks. Lots of flowering. Uh, just note people are in the yard noticing what's going on. Good for you. Be right back with Kennelly Lane and the mountain gardeners. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Once upon a time, Fred the Sage and Bob the Yucca watched a herd of deer eat their neighbor's garden. Hey, Bob, said Fred. It's a good thing we're native Arizona plants from Waters Garden Center. Right, Fred, said Bob. We can handle tough Prescott dirt, hot sun, low water, and we look great in the garden. You betcha, Bob, said Fred. Hummingbirds and bees love us, but that deer sure doesn't. Be like Fred and Bob. Go native at Waters Garden Center. Safe, natural, and organic. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Okay, so I, I ended the, the beginning of the show with fertilizers. Uh, what When to do it now, so before the monsoon hit, so by... The first week of July, you should fertilize everything in the landscape, everything. I mean, trees, every shrub, every flower bed, every lawn, everything should get fertilized because that first rain comes and you can really set the stage for beautiful new buds, growth, new leaves, new flowers. The plants can really, really respond to that. All the food you put down last spring, you've watered that. It used it up to flush this, the growth that's on there now. That's, that's gone. And so if you don't fertilize, your plants will start to yellow. They'll start to drop leaves because they don't have enough food because they're starving to death. So fertilize now. And I said, put, put humic on first to the stressed things to feed the soil. Then in a week or two, follow up with the all-purpose plant food, that 744 mix. And with that, that uh, sequence, you're going to have a really, really stunning new foliage on those plants. Okay, that's it. But... I said I would go deeper into what is the 744? What are those numbers? What do they really mean? Let me just explain that. So your main numbers, all fertilizers, if it's registered with the state of Arizona, is required to have a number to tell us how much nitrogen, how much phosphorus, and how much potash is in each pound of, of, of fertilizer that's in there. So you'll see 20, 20, 20, 10, 10, 10, minus 744. So you'll see these different numbers. Nitrogen is the first number, always nitrogen. Nitrogen is the fastest releasing of the, of the three. It's uh, also the hottest. That's the one that burns uh, your plants. If you leave it setting on top of a, a leaf, it'll spot the leaf. It'll burn the leaf. But nitrogen forms new green growth. So with, let's say, a lawn, many times a lawn food would be like ammonium sulfate, 2100. Lawns don't care about anything but nitrogen. Give me more. I want more because they're always pushing new blades of grass. And you're mowing it. So you got to, got to keep up on that. So you give that a lot of nitrogen. Trees need actually more nitrogen than you think that they would. 
Fruit trees need more phosphorus, the second number. So nitrogen is green growth, leaves, the amount of green you see on a tree. Phosphorus is roots and blooms. That middle number is if you want a bigger root structure, more flowers, you want your grapes to be big, juicy, larger grapes, you give them phosphorus. You want your apples to be larger, uh, you give them phosphorus. You want more of your roses to be bigger, phosphorus. Phosphorus is what you want, middle number. The last number is potash. Potash is uh, really disease hardiness. That's how thick is the leaf? How, how sturdy is the stem? Does it hold the fruit upright? Does it drop the fruit or does it hold it onto the tree? That's going to be potash. And so sometimes you'll see the East Coast folks. They'll say, oh, take all your ash from your barbecue, from your fire pits, and throw them around your plants because you want to have ash because it will make them more robust, sturdier. Don't do that here. You did not hear that from me. I will never give you that advice. Here, you want to take that ash, you want to put it up against where the fence line is, uh, down the driveway where you want nothing to grow. If you want to sterilize and kill the soil, give it potash. Because we have so much naturally occurring potash in our soil already, if you give it more, you'll literally sterilize the soil. Now that is very high in pH, so our water is high in pH. So it counteracts with the interacts with that ash, and all of a sudden you've got death and decay rains wherever you put ash. So do, so do not put your ash. Let it cool down and throw it away. Get it off of your property. You don't want to use it yourself unless you do a soil test or do something fancy. Don't don't use it. I've made this mistake before. My name's Ken. We're friends. We're just neighbors talking over the fence, and here's the blunders I've made. Don't, we don't want you to do that yourself. Don't do that. So all the uh, all the hilltops in, in northern Arizona, uh, from Bill Williams Mountain to the Thumb Butte in the middle of Prescott, all the uh, Glassford Hill in Prescott Valley, all those hilltops, they're volcanoes. That's the core left, and all that ash that was around that core has settled down, and now you and I, we are gardening in that, and that's, that's the reason that's, that's that case. So... Nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. In addition, you've got some micronutrients. These are things like iron, magnesium, copper, uh, minor trace elements. You need a little bit, but if you're gardening at all and, and composting at all, you're going to get enough usually unless you get into really specialized crops. Uh, some of your herbal crops or your pecans. They need a lot more zinc, that kind of stuff. But other than that, most gardeners in the backyard... Nitrogen, phosphorus, potash get a good blend that releases over a very long period of time that have some minor trace elements, you're good to go. For our fertilizer, the one that I put together, our recipe, this is one I put together with these two hands. I've been tweaking that recipe. It's kind of like a good cookie recipe or good whatever, you're, whatever you like to cook. Fertilizers are like that. I, I actually put more sulfur in that fertilizer, and I think that makes more difference than anything. So I know that your pH is going to be very high. So I'm going, okay, if all my customers are struggling with to keep their pH down, let's change the chemistry. Let's, while they're fertilizing, help them to change their chemistry so the food works better, stronger, more, there's more reaction. So we put a 2-3% sulfur in that bag, and when you water it, it lowers the pH of that, that uh, your garden soil so plants can take up more of the food. And so that's kind of water's all-purpose plant food, that 744 mix. That's why it works so well. Okay, be right back with Lisa Waters Lane after this. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Purple Magic Crepe Myrtle. You'll be wowed by the sheer amount and intensity of the purple blossoms that shadow this impressive bush. Leaves emerge as bold red foliage in spring and then turn bright green just as the purple flowers erupt in summer. It blooms twice, first in summer, then again in autumn. And at $39, you can have more than one in the gardens. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Timeless Beauty Desert Willow Tree. Large, fragrant burgundy and lavender flowers appear in big, bold clusters all summer long. This unique water selection is prized for its extra-long bloom time without the native seed pods. 
The flowers are highly attractive to hummingbirds, 100% Arizona native, and just $59. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love their native plants to really bloom, they love to shop. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane. This segment's all about her and her gardens and her vision and her artistic flair for fragrance and color and bringing it all together. She's got, she made her way through college as a florist. Oh, and her, she didn't say, you usually say old florist. Yeah. As an old florist. As an old florist. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a vibrant young florist. Of course, I was dating the vibrant young florist. And now you're um, married to the old florist. Yeah. <laughs> hey, stop it. I'm right there with you, my dear. I know. Right there with you and loving it. Yes. I think women get more beautiful with age. Oh. At least you sweet. are. Well, thanks, dear. Yeah. I like hanging out. You, you haven't lost. It's not what's important on the outside. It's what's important on the... Is that Disney? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Sounds we, like tripe to me. Okay. We, we won't go down that path. Or we will <laughs> offend a lot of people, including ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, dear. It's a very nice compliment. Yeah. So uh, this week, you've got mm-hmm. what for us? Inspire well, us. Inspire. Oh, so much pressure. So I was looking on the Waters Facebook page, and on there you post um, some pictures that we do of plantings in yeah. the area. And one of the pictures was of a big blue spruce, yeah. absolutely gorgeous. And that one, a lot of people were commenting on, and I and I hear it in the store a lot too. People going, "Oh, you can't plant those this time of year, can you?" <laughs> you know, and, people are so funny. <laughs> they get worried about the heat. I guess, you know, and I understand it. I wouldn't want to be planted yeah. in the heat. But the answer is yes, you can. Because it always comes down to pop, proper planting and proper watering. Um, so, yes, you can put those evergreens in now, the big ones, and they'll be fine. You know, the team, this planting team, our folks that we send out in the field, they're not just planters. They're not just hired guns or run jackhammers. Go, guys, plant that. These are actually smart. We've got guys that have 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 basically taken care of vineyards mm-hmm. uh sales certified sale uh, nursery uh sales folks i mean they're trained in the field they're great to get resource to ask ideas while they're out in the field what do you think of this or do you think i should mm-hmm. put some what they they actually can help you that way and they speak english and they're just that whole they've got it all together mm-hmm. and so people don't realize how many, we've got two trucks that's all they do is run around the county planting things uh, and they plant evergreens. The key is don't leave the root ball exposed very long. Get it in the ground, then water it thoroughly as you plant it. And then we talk them into taking their cell phones and taking some pictures when they're done, before and after. We've got a, a waters planted by Waters Gardens, and we have the owner <laughs> if they'll if they agree yeah. to to step up and and uh, get their picture taken with the mm-hmm. sign going, "Hey, planted by Waters. This is my plant." And so they've got some really kind of. Amateur, fun, easy, casual photos. We put those up on our social media pages, and Mm -hmm. you're right. Some of them get, oh, that looks so much better. Yeah. We try to do before and after, Mm -hmm. but then that's hard to see because you got ugly. (laughs) And then nice, finally. And we we find that just the nice pictures kind of gain a lot of likes or or, Mm – or they, they're the ones that get comments on. Right, right. It's good. So, yes, you can definitely plant now, taking the precautions like you said. Definitely. So I kind of went out and perused the nursery yard. Oh, here we go. To see what we had out there. So these are evergreens like spruce and pine, or they're, they're like uh, screening plants like cypress and Italian cypress and juniper. So there's and... a little of both. Okay. So, yeah, definitely there's some screening plants. Your Wichita blue junipers, Spartan junipers, uh, arborvitaes, those like those. But, yeah, they're not... I mean, they're pretty, but they're not a specimen tree. You're not going to put it in the middle of your yard and, and sing to it. If I were a juniper right now, I would be offended. I know you would. <laughs> Wichita uh, blue, I think, can be that way. Such as that so. silver blue. It's so pretty. I mean, it's pretty, but it's it doesn't go, you don't go, oh, look at that tree. In okay. the middle of your yard. All right. No, you wouldn't, put, you wouldn't side, put lights on screen. it. You wouldn't actually, like yeah. a Colorado spruce or something, that is right. like a showstopper. That's right. true. So, But yes, we do have plenty of those screening type okay. trees. But we also have some outstanding spruce right now. And, and to me, those are showstoppers. Those are ones you put in the, in the front of your yard or in a very special spot to make a statement. Uh, I think the, the one that I really like the best is the Fat Albert. 
the color on the Fat Alberts is so striking. Uh, that kind of silvery blue just stands out in the yard, especially when you got a lot of just green everywhere. Yeah, that's true. It makes kind a, a statement. Not even an Arizona blue. It's, it's silver. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like a bright sparkle blue. Right. It's, it's that. Mm-hmm. And maybe we should tell folks how they do that. So that a really desirous tree. So you can plant seed, mm-hmm. and they will come up sporadically, and, and you have no consistency whatsoever, but right. they're cheaper. And then you take a very strong root, you cut the tree off of it, and you graft this desirable tree onto that root ball. So uh, Fed Albert Spruce is actually a grafted tree onto a more selective or hardier root system. And so now you've got this cookie cutter. I mean, they're kinetic, mm-hmm. kinetic clones. They look exactly like the mother plant they were cut from. They grow up to the exact density, exact color, same spacing you know, of the needles. They're exact cookie cutter models of each. Um, even our Colorado spruce, we'd rather have a Colorado spruce that's grafted, which makes them a little more expensive, but it makes sure they are beautiful for the entire lifespan of their tree. You really don't want one that's done by, by seed. And you really don't want one that's taken a cutting and rooted the cutting. You actually want to graft it onto something stronger so it can take our heat. And that's why our trees, if you know, water is more expensive, but their trees always live. Well, that's why, because we always get the best stuff, the better. Those are things you don't see. Mm-hmm. It just go, oh, it's a tree's a tree. That's not true. A tree is not just a tree. There are better varieties of trees, just like people. There are some that are just, <laughs> they belong on the front of magazines. You just want to take a picture and look at them. There's kind of like plants are that way, too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I learned I've, something because I didn't we, realize those were grafted. The fruit trees the I same feel way. Stupid now. Why no. Your fruit trees were grafted. Well, that's why people tune in, so I think we can learn stuff like that. So I learned something. That's yeah. exciting. Uh, the other couple that are unique are the uh, blues weeping spruce, blue spruce, and then there's a weeping Norway spruce as well. Oh yeah, pretty. And I think those definitely make very pretty oh, specimen yeah. type plants because they're just so unique. You are not going to see those in every yard. It's not like a Fotinia where you have to have yeah. three Fotinia. Uh, so very unique. Great. You know what put. I think of those, those weeping varieties? Mm-hmm. It's an emotional, you have to decide. <laughs> you either go, oh, I can't believe how beautiful that is. Look how it's weeping. Look how it flows everywhere. It's so pretty. And other people go, who would have that? It's ugly. What is that thing? Why would you do that? It's, a, it's an emotional. It's like art right. in living form. It You have to have this emotional connection or true. disconnection. That is true. There's a weeping Atlas Cedar, too, that I think is just stunning. Uh, there's a beautiful one down. Is it by the Methodist Church downtown? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, stunning. it's a pretty one. It's a pretty old one. I saw one at a customer's house. Was, they trained it to go up to the deck, and then it wrapped around the deck. They actually trained oh, wow. it to go around the deck. This weeping Dieter seat is long runner going around. Basically, weeping it felt Atlas like you're yeah, it okay. felt like you were in a treehouse or something. Wow. It's beautiful. that's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's a neat one. Definitely one to look at. And we got in, these have been the hardest trees to find. I've never What's worked that? so hard to find some trees. Deodor cedars. Oh, sure. Yeah. We're calling in favors everywhere. <laughs> uh, we finally got a favor. I mean, we have people scouring, yeah. looking for us. So some really pretty Deodor cedars came in. What a nice tree. You know, it's a good replacement for those people who lost their Leland cypress. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Fast growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fast growing, drought hardy. Um, this is a really pretty tree. So it's a good replacement for that because people this year, the Lelands are just really yeah. going. There's a canker. There's a, basically the black plague is going <laughs> through. They call it Leland Cypress, but we call it plant plague. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's killing off. If they were stressed at all, they're dying. That's it. If they got water stress, food, any kind of stress, they're dying. That's it. Yeah. And there's nothing we can, there's no cure. We mm-hmm. can't get past it. So entire rows are collapsing on us. Mm-hmm. It's very sad. I mean, old 20-year-old plants right. going, dying all at once. It's yeah. very heart-wrenching just, yeah, just kind of see think, that. I think the drought this winter really kind of is helping them Took it along. to them. Yeah. yeah. So, but Deodor, take a look at it. It would be a really nice replacement. So 25-foot, maybe 40-foot oh, tall bigger, yeah. by 20-foot wide, big swooping branches mm-hmm. coming out. That's a, that's a Deodor cedar. Great uh, screening tree, great uh, fast, mm-hmm. probably the fastest growing of the evergreens. Right. That... Are low maintenance, low Q 
care, doesn't get disease kind of plants. Thank you, Lisa. Evergreens. There's that and more here at Waters Garden Center. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Gold Star, Potentia. A rising star in the landscape, bathed in flowers as gold as an Arizona sunset. Growing to only knee high and wide, this shrub loves growing in our sun and uniquely resistant to heat, wind, water, fire, and deer. All wrapped up in a showy little package and under 30 bucks. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love gold stars wrapped in tidy little packages, they love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Lavender Shades Blooming Penta. One of the best butterfly attracting plants. It's right up there with milkweed, only prettier. Hummingbirds have to dance around all the butterflies of this deeply colored summer bloomer. Plant a few in the vegetable garden to attract pollinators that help tomatoes and squash set more fruit, all for under $10. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. Something that I was doing in my own gardens this week, I was deadheading things. So I took the I took the head shears. I did a lot of my summer pruning this week. You would think, oh, you don't prune the summer. Well, I do. So the uh, meadow sage, the Jupiter's beard, or or Ceanothus, the wild flower, wild uh, uh, pink blooming flower, about knee high. Uh, they had a bunch of dead, spent flowers. And so I was setting the stage for the monsoon. So what I did is I, I did I took all the all the dead spent flowers off, and then I'll fertilize it with the all-purpose plant food. And that first rain, I mean, literally the very first rain that we get in July, they will start to bud and flower again. So I'll have a whole nother. My entire backyard will look like nothing but this beautiful wildflower patch, and you can trick them into blooming again for you. Uh, it works for a lot of different perennials, and it works for all of your annuals. So if you don't let them put that uh, spent flower, you don't let them go to seed, they'll actually focus their energy on, oh, my seed are gone. Oh, what am I going to do? I better put more flowers out so I can attract more bees so I can form a seed because I want to form seed. That's what I do. I'm a flower. I need to set more seed. So if you keep them from, from thinking that way, they'll actually bloom over and over and over again for you. So for mine, I, I pruned back the uh, penstemons. They were kind of done and looking mangy. Uh, they won't rebloom again, but they look better. That's basically. Uh, I pruned back uh, what a cat mint. It's beautiful blue, uh, hardy herb. It's been out in the yard. It's been blooming since March. It finally laid down and got too leggy. It had some flowers on it. It was laying down. It was bringing the gardens down. I said, okay, that's it. She whacked it right back. I mean, just cut it right back to the heart of the plant. A little bit of green is left, but again, I'll fertilize it. That all-purpose food, the first rain comes, and it will be in full bloom for another three-month stint of blossoms. And so my bees were a little upset because they were pollinating, but, but bees are welcome when the plants look beautiful. But if the plants are ugly, you're not welcome. Go, go find someone. Go bother someone else. And so I cut back uh, the oak. Oaks had flushed my scrub oaks mainly because you know they 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 are too aggressive sometimes. So I cut them back and got them back into more shapely, kind of natural. But I gave them a hard haircut. Is what I did. Otherwise, they'll tend to encroach on other parts of the garden where they shouldn't be. And so I'm going, guys, you're you're getting too you're you're too aggressive. Let me help you. Click click click. Cut them back. I've got um, I cut back. My peach, peaches have been harvested, and then it elongates and it puts on what we call suckers. Well, in my container, I don't want a tree to get too big. And so basically, it's allowed to grow as tall as I am when I'm standing up on the edge of the of the pot. So it can't be over. So from the patio, it looks like it's grown about, I don't know, nine feet tall. But if I can't reach up and reach the top, it gets pruned off. Because it gets out of proportion. It gets hard to deal with. I can't pick it. I just don't let it grow. And the secret with your fruit trees is summer pruning to keep them to the size that you want. And you don't hear this in the in the books. They all tell you oh, winter pruning is the best. 
What I find is to really maintain them and keep them shapely, keep them manageable, I prune them in the summer. And I'm selective. It's not as hard as my winter pruning, but it is strategic. And it's mainly to keep it down where where you started at this spring. I want you to be this size, only more luscious. I mean, if I could only have it rebloom and refruit more peaches, that would be even better. But we can only ask for so much, right? But that's something I was doing myself. Uh, another thing I to watch, just if you're tuned in, your tomatoes. If your tomatoes have dead anything on it, make sure to pick that off immediately. Don't let leaf disease and vertinillum wilt and all these look, tomatoes are looking to die. They want to die. They're here to die. And they want to die from a disease, from some leaf spot. And so they're really sensitive so for me, I just go through and once a week and I sip my coffee and I have my little trash can there and I just pick off any yellow leaves or spotted leaves or curled leaves. I go, okay, that's good. I throw them in the trash can. I don't want them in the compost pile because they're diseased and they'll just spread throughout the entire bush and your bush will die by the, by after the first month of monsoon, it really goes crazy. So as soon as you give it some humidity, it takes over. So I want to strategically try to keep that Cleanliness is next to godliness when it comes to tomatoes, especially. So I did that with my beets. I did that with uh, the squash. Had a couple large leaves that were, you know, squash and pumpkins. They love to get mildew. So if I see any yellow, I just cut it off, throw it away, and then I fertilize it with the all-purpose plant food. I know it's a, it's a theme, but it's time to fertilize with your all-purpose plant food. Keep things growing. Set the stage for this growing season. This whole other planting season is going to happen that first rain in July. And so we're down to the wire. It's, we, we get the, the monsoonal pattern starting to swing this way. It's in New Mexico. It'll be at the border of Arizona and New Mexico next week. It'll rain over, over the White Mountains for a while. I'm jealous from you folks tuning in over there. I wish we had that here. And then we wait patiently while we hear stories uh, of, of it's raining the White Mountains. And then it finally swings over and hits Payson and Flagstaff and Prescott. And hopefully it keeps on swinging and gets you know, Kingman and, and the other, the, the river country. So, but we'll see how the, the, the season holds. But set the stage now for great plants. That's why I've told you all along, just keep them alive. All you want to do, keep your plants alive in June. That's all you need. They don't have to look fabulous because the monsoons are coming. When we fertilize right then, it just takes off. And so I like to put the foods down before that first rains. If you know it's coming, I just put it down now. The, the thing I mentioned at the top of the hour, at the beginning of the show is I, I do actually, I have put down Humic. Natural Guard puts down this unbelievable product. I mean, just really very affordable. It uh, goes a long ways, and it does magical stuff for your plants. Anything stressed, anything that is just newly planted, if it's under two years old, it takes two years to get a root, get get a, a small five-gallon or 15-gallon plant, get the roots from that container bucket Two years to get that those roots into the surrounding soil. If it's a newer plant, Humic, H-U-M-I-C, it's kind of a funky name. I wish they'd get better at this, but it's Natural Guard is the company. It's a natural organic product. It's safe, doesn't burn uh, your plants, but it lowers the pH, but it mainly feeds the worms, the, the mycorrhizals, the, the fungi, the things that live in the soil. Your plants realize what dead soil is and nothing's going to grow there. Or living soil, and your plants actually get teased. They get excited about a, a soil that's actually alive and growing more than just their roots. It's They're interacting with the things that are growing in the soil. So if you feed that soil, the plant just starts rooting deeper and stronger and, and healthier, and it will recover. Any of your natives that were stressed out, you're seeing bark beetle, you're seeing obvious signs of leaf curl on, on those oaks or, or anything going wrong, put the humic on it and water it in. Don't wait for the rains to come. Water it in right away. Get that stuff acting now. And then in a week or two, when the monsoons do come, fertilize. You're setting the stage with more roots by the, with the humic, and then you've got more root uptake, more the plant can take up more of the plant foods once it does start raining. 
So that that's kind of some things I've been doing in my in our, my own gardens. We're starting the harvest. So I've got little cucumbers on. I've got little melons starting. The uh, giant pumpkins are growing crazy right now. Uh, we're we're picking tomatoes. Uh, I'm deadheading those flowers. Things like dahlias. Uh, that just get, don't let them set seed. Keep plucking off those spent flowers, and you'll find that you'll have a beautiful yard that just keeps on growing, uh, keeps on showing off, and it will only get better as the monsoons hit. And so that's what we really want to set the stage for. So if you've got more questions on that, I've got fertilizer guides here, the four steps of fertilizing. I've got, we've got free handouts for you to help you, but you tuned in. You just got it all over the radio waves. There you go. Okay, Ken, the mountain gardener, your friend, your neighbor, just helping you have nicer gardens in your own backyard. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the mountain gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Pink Volcano Phlox. Just when spring flowers are fading, these beauties revive and show off. Your grandmother only dreamed of growing a pretty pink phlox this fine. Each flower cluster could make a bridal bouquet all by itself. This new volcano series is erupting with flowers used to accent entries and fountains, all for $15. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love eruptions of pink flowers, they love to shop. I grew up in the family business with my three sisters, and I've raised four of my own kids in the same garden center. Waters isn't just another business in town. This is part of our home, an extension of who we are. My family spends more time here than we do at home. It's basically an extension of our living room. We just have more friends over than most. My name is Lisa Waters Lane, and you'll feel welcomed, peaceful, and at home here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Now this week, I I wrote a garden column on tomatoes. Determinant or indeterminate? What's the difference? And so I just went deep into, into... how do you grow a tomato and why are some of them just growing wild like a vine? And some of them are saying nice and cute and healthy and, and easy to grow. Well, that, I just explained all of that. If that kind of information is interesting to you, and, and, and I wrote that because um, my tomatoes are going crazy. I went, if other people are doing that, they, they probably want to know. And so I just said I share that. So basically, it's my garden info. Whatever's top of mind. That's what you get. You don't have a choice. And so if that's important to you, if that seems like local garden content that's timely, it's right exactly when you're, you're thinking about it, basically, uh, subscribe. Ask to be a part of the club. And so uh, I'll write a garden column each week, and it goes right from my desktop to yours, and you can be up to date on that. And so you go to watersgardencenter.com. There's a sign-up page. It says, hey, sign up for the free newsletter. It's free. As soon as you get bothered or it's not good advice or it's just too dry and bland and I can't read Ken's boring stuff, it's meant to be entertaining and informative both, um, you can unsubscribe. There's always a unsubscribe button at the top and the bottom. If you don't want it, we want you off the list. We don't want to spam people. That drives me crazy when I get on a list and I can't get off. I'll actually report you to, I'm belligerent enough, I'll report you to Google saying, hey, this guy's a spammer, watch him. And I'll actually report it and give them, put the flags around. I'll parade you in front of the board going, this guy's bothering me. I don't want to do that. You don't do that to your friends. You just don't do that. But anyway, watersgardencenter.com. I think on our Facebook page, it's it's got a, a sign-up button there as well at the top. So facebook.com forward slash watersgardencenter. You, you Facebook folks, you know what that is. And it's real easy to get. It's free. Or if you're coming into the garden center, just ask. Hey, Ken said there was some newsletter. What, what's a garden thing? What, what, how do I get that? And they'll quickly ask you just for your email. That's it. Uh, your, 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 your secret. Other than that, we don't want to know all your details. Uh, that's between you and you. 
So in, indeterminate and determinate, though, it basically says, how big does it go? So determinate is a determined size. It gets up to a certain size, and it stays cuter, smaller, easier. Indeterminate keeps on growing. It's like a vining variety. So it keeps going up. That's your, your, uh, your celebrities, champions. Uh, most of the names you know, those are indeterminate. They need a tomato cage. They won't stand up on their own. They're going to be a ground cover and go everywhere. That's, that's what I basically explained. And then I went into details of my favorite varieties, uh, what I do myself to actually promote more tomatoes. So we picked our first tomatoes this week and they were so sweet. My mouth's watering just thinking about them. Uh, but right now, what I'm, what I am doing myself, once a week, I spray my tomatoes with something. Not just my tomatoes. I spray my melons and cucumbers and things. So this week, I just hit them with blossom set. So with the heat, they won't set blossoms. But the blossom set forces them to hold that pollinated fruit, that flower, and start forming a fruit. The next week, I use rot stop. R O T stop. It's it's a calcium. And so every week I put rot stop or blossom set rot stop all through the growing season. I just have a can of each and I go through and it helps me because it's therapy. I go here guys, you know, and fruit and be happy. I'm here for you. I'm your gardener because I want your tomatoes tomorrow. So it's, that's, that's basically a nutshell. You can get that on, at watersgardencenter.com under the blog. I'm sure it, it's right there, but uh, each week, we also have garden classes. Next week, it's on tomatoes. And so every Saturday at 930, uh, you can have a free garden class. So take a look and, and join us for that. They're meant to help you be a better gardener. Again, watersgardencenter.com. There's a button right on the very front that says classes. We want to make it easy for you to find. Until this week, until this week, next week, <laughs> come visit Lisa and I here at Waters Garden Center. We love visiting with friends that have been tuned into the show. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. I used to be cocky and actually dared to beat the big boxes at their own game. Since the beginning, we were known for the very best plants in town. But with youthful ambition, we added a line of inferior plants, contractor grade, that matched the box stores and beat their prices. We failed miserably. The plants were side by side. Waters hand-picked quality at the higher price and the inferior plants at the lower price with astounding results. The inferior plants, not bad quality, just not full and nice, were still there a month later. The hand-picked quality plants, they had been restocked twice and the bench was empty again. The youthful cockiness, it's tempered and with age comes wisdom and knowing who you really are. Waters Garden Center doesn't compete with the marts and the boxes. We simply grow the very best plants our family is famous for. We will never offer inferior plants. Cross my heart. Pinky swear. Waters Garden Center. 1815 Iron Springs Road here in Prescott. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.